Good morning, everyone, or good day, or good evening, good afternoon, um, if you're on here with me live. Hey, um, if you are catching this on a replay, um, go ahead and put replay in the comments for me. And if you have any questions about this, um, feel free to leave them in the comments and at me. And I would be more than happy to answer your questions. So um, every Tuesday I come in and do a coffee talk in the morning. Um, for me, it's tea. For you guys, it's probably coffee. Um, and today we're actually going to be talking about drawing inspiration from art, um, which is something as photographers, I'm not sure that we do um, all the time. And I think it's something that we can do. And and draw quite a bit of inspiration from the different art forms. So today we're going to go over that. So um, if you're not signed up through Restream, leave me when you're leaving a message, if you do that, um, or asking a question, type your name at the end of it so that I know who I'm speaking with. Um, and if you have any questions, again, name at the end of it so I know who I'm speaking with. Um, and I would love to, to have this be a conversation. Good morning. I don't know who that Facebook user is, but good morning to you. Um, I would really like for this to be a conversation as opposed to just me speaking with you guys. Um, so if you have any questions um, or any comments or anything that you want to share that you think the community would like, you know, get value from, that would be amazing as well. The whole point of Coffee Talk Tuesdays is to bring free education and information to our community of boudoir photographers and try and elevate our skill set and our industry um, and our ability to be amazing artists and photographers and great business people as well. So good morning to everybody. Um, I'm glad that you guys are here. Um, so we're going to jump into this. We are going to talk about drawing art from inspiration and before I get into it, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this image. Um, so this was portfolio work that I created when I went to Portrait Masters. Um, I cannot take credit for the styling um, or the backdrop, hair, makeup, wardrobe, all of that kind of stuff. What I can absolutely take credit for is being inspired by what they had at the shooting bays and then very much making it my own. Um, so I went to Portrait Masters and all of the shooting bays were very, you know, typical beauty portrait type of stuff. Um, and I made the decision that I, I didn't want to shoot what everyone else was shooting. I wanted to be inspired by what was there, but I wanted to put my own spin on it. So with this young lady, her name is Aphrodite, or that's the name she goes by, um, all of the images that we saw come out at Portrait Masters of her were um, very angelic. It's kind of like she was like... Um, Mother Mary. And when I saw it, I was like, okay, well, let's just go ahead and turn her into Mary Magdalena. Um, and, you know, I immediately, when it was my turn to shoot, went up to the model and told her, okay, I don't want you to do any modeling. Um, if you're okay with that, I'm going to guide, coach, and direct you. And I want to make this a little bit different. I kind of want to turn it on its head. And this is my idea. And she was like, yes, let's do it. Um, I'm still in contact with the model. Hopefully, I'll be shooting her again soon when we're in the same location. Um, with all of my own styling and my own concept. Um, but still, you can take inspiration from so many different places and in so many different ways. So with this, there was this beautiful art installation in front of me, and I had a choice. I could let her model for me, and I could shoot like everyone else was shooting, or I could put my own spin on it and be inspired by it and create my own work. And the work that I created at Portrait Masters is million times different than anything else that came out of Portrait Masters, which is exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to make it my own. Um, so we're going to learn some about art history today because I think it's a good thing as photographers, photography being an offshoot of the visual arts, it's a good idea for us to know some about art history um, and to be able to be inspired by it. So that's what we're doing today. Um, I hope that you all enjoy it. This is going to be a long coffee talk. Just letting you know there's a lot in here. 
Um, if you can't catch it all right now, that's fine. You can come back on the replay, but it'd be awesome if you hung in there with me because we've got some important stuff to talk about. Okay, so here we go. Drawing inspiration from art. So again, the images that I took here at Portrait Masters, quite different than all of the angelic um quite ethereal, beautiful things that were being taken of this particular model. I even undressed her some, which um, I got scolded for a little bit, but, you know, had to go with what I was feeling. So uh, this, there's a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and if you guys aren't f familiar with Emerson, he is a fantastic, probably one of my favorite humans that has lived. He's He was just an amazing, amazing man. Um, who was very insightful um, and very wise. And Emerson says, when the eyes say one thing and the tongue another, a practiced man relies on the language of the first. Basically what Emerson is telling us in this quote is that we don't pay attention to language as much as we pay attention to what we see. And what we see makes us feel. And as photographers, that's incredibly relevant to us. We don't have the we don't have the opportunity to have you know conversation in our photographs. Everything we do is based on body language, and so knowing how to coach and direct for body language, understanding body language, creating really beautiful emotive works of art that make people see, as opposed to paying attention to what's being said or just creating pretty pictures. Um, is quite the gift. And there was a post that was put up in the group yesterday by Kaylee where she showed us some images that she took before Strip Down. And they were beautiful images. Like the background was beautiful. Um, the creative execution of it was beautiful. And then she took them again after taking the course with the same model, different backdrop, different styling. But when she added the emotive elements and the emotive body language to the images, oh my God, they just like... They're bananas. If you haven't seen them, you should scroll through the group and take a look and leave her some love because she has put in a lot of work into learning the stripped down methodology and it absolutely unequivocally shows in her work. It's just fucking beautiful. Just absolutely beautiful. It's so beautiful that I was like, oh shit, I need to buy a lens baby. And I bought one like on the spot because I was so inspired by what she did. And that, that additional tool, that lens baby, it's just an additional tool. The thing that really made those images so incredibly powerful was the addition of emotive states to the work as opposed to just creating pretty pictures. And I think that's what so many of us as portrait photographers, as wedding photographers, as boudoir photographers, that's what we want to do. We want to stand out. We want to create work that we're like really proud of. And so... I'm going to try and bring you today some art history that is going to help hopefully inspire you to do some of those things. So just when you think you know something, which for us is photography, right? We think we know all we need to know about being photographers. You have to look at it in another way. Even though it may seem silly or wrong, you must try. And this is a quote from the Dead Poet Society. Again, if you haven't seen this film, watch it. It's amazing. I'm curious how many of you were at Portrait Masters, um, and I would love to see the work that you created there as well. And I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to be going, I've got two monitors here, so I'm not paying attention. It's not that I'm not paying attention to you. I'm just looking over here at, at comments. So I just want to take a look at the comments really quick before I keep going. Yeah, Wanda, that was amazing, wasn't it? And then Facebook user, I haven't purchased a strip down course yet, but I have used the things you've freely given to us and it's made all the difference in my growth. That makes me very happy to hear. That is awesome. Um, and Amber, the image is so powerful and that crown on her head is incredible. I agree. The, the styling on that was really quite phenomenal. And I really just wanted to like, oof, turn it on its head and make it like, strong and raw and like unadulterated and again I wanted to be more like Mary Magdalene than Mother Mary inspired but putting my own spin on it and creating like emotive 
body language in it so that I could take it to the next level. Um, and I think having a background in art has helped me do those kind of things. So let's get you guys some background in art as well. Okay, so some of us have classical, classical training in the arts and some of us are versed in art history. Some of us are just creative by nature. But wherever we are on our journey as photographers and artists, we can better be inspired by stepping outside of our box and drawing inspiration from other genres of art. We don't just have to look at photographer's work. We can do that as well. Um, but when we do it, we should probably step outside of the industry and do it. Um, sometimes we need to look outside of the area we know and are comfortable in to draw additional inspiration and growth from. So I hope, I hope, really, really hope to spark that flame of interest in you today. So we're going to engage in a conversation and exploration of the often very heated de debated topic of art. Um, one that I mean, no one can seem to agree on what art is, and that's okay because it's very subjective. Subjective. So one of the ways we can do that is to learn to see things with new eyes or look for inspiration in our work by exploring other creative mediums, not just photography. And by doing this, we can actually learn, grow, and stretch, and really flourish in really new and exciting and also really fun ways. So there's been a debate that has raged on like as long as art has existed and that debate continues today and it's what is art. And I, I put a post up in the group the other day and I asked like, you know, what is art? And oh my goodness, the, the responses were beautiful and they were so varied. Like everybody, it really is subjective, you guys. Everybody has their own idea of what art is, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, so many argue that art can't be defined, and a lot of people argue that it can. And in my opinion, personally, with art being subjective, which means it's not a proven fact, I can't argue this point one way or another to a conclusion that's really satisfactory to all. Um, but I can tell you, for me, in my personal experience with the arts and being a human being, art really does have a resonance within humanity and our collective unconscious. And this is something that Carl Jung taught us. And if you don't know who Carl Jung is, you might want to jot down this name. Um, I do not recommend that you go buy any books written by Carl Jung himself. They are very intense. Um, and very labor intensive to read. Um, but if you go high level with Carl Jung or read books that people have written about Carl and or Dr. Jung and his um, his philosophy, um, I think you'll gain a lot of insights into humanity, which will very much help you as a portrait photographer. So emotive works of art, regardless of the genre, doesn't matter what genre is, they actually move us in ways that are very uniquely human and incredibly beautiful and spectacular. And it's in our best interest to understand that this is really important. And so we really want to understand this as portrait photographers and learn what we can from the other genres. Um, another quote I really love is her face looked for the answers that is always concealed in language. Again, we're talking about, we use language, right, to try and convey what we want to convey, but the truth is always in the body language, which is why it's so incredibly important to know it and understand it, and be able to coach and direct for it. So, Body language in painting, body language in dance, in sculpture, and in photography, it elicits a subconscious response in the viewer, the period, full stop. That is, that is not something that is arguable. That this is not subjective. This is scientifically proven, period. And I'm a girl who loves science. 
So our very makeup as a species creates these reactions in us and they're chemical reactions and they're things that we have no control over. They just happen in our body and within our brain and our neural systems. So as an artist, it's really important to understand the nature of the tools that we use to create a response and the viewers who experience our work, like the, all of the great masters who came before us have. And I, I'm just going to break away here for a second. We are at such an advantage at this point point in time in history in being artists. Michelangelo did not have the benefit of all of the studies done by neuroscience. Neither did Van Gogh, neither did Vermeer, Rembrandt. Um, I mean, the list just goes on and on. Um, even like as, as not so far back as Baryshnikov, the dancer, they didn't have the, the solid scientific proof that that we have, that we can actually learn from. They were great masters because they just intuitively knew. And so if we're sitting here and we're like, well, shit, I don't intuitively knew. No. How am I going to be a great master? You can be. The stripped down course will take you there. We go through all of it. There's so much rich science um, that will help us get there, that it's it's phenomenal. We're living in a wonderful time to be artists, you guys. So um, now I lost my spot. <laughs> so let's see. We don't have to throw darts blindfolded at a target and just hope that we create and evoke a response in responses. But with precision and intention in our art, if we understand how we can do that. So part of that understanding will come from understanding the other mediums of art that we can actually learn from and we can be inspired by. So another quote that I really love that I think is super relevant to this is, and the human race is filled with passion and medicine, law, business, engineering, and these are all very noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are the things that we stay alive for. Um, again, if you haven't watched that film, it's probably going to inspire you. You might want to make time to watch it. It's amazing. Oh, yes. Captain, my captain. <laughs> oh, Andrea, you totally just got my heart right there for sure. Okay. So what is art? This is what I believe. Now, everybody, it's, again, it's subjective. Everybody has their own ideas. So I believe the following is true about art in regards to boudoir photography. Art is actually a joint venture when we're creating it with our subjects. So it's not just of ourselves. It's something that we are creating with another person. So human connection and intimacy with us and our clients is incredibly important for us executing our craft in a beautiful and artful way. Um, art is the medium between what we know and what we feel. Um Art al allows us to express our ideas and our creativity and that of our clients. Art enables us to accept and celebrate differences, which is really important in our social climate. Um, art is a way to be exactly who we are and express what we can't in our daily lives. We can do that for ourselves and we can do that for our clients. Art gives us the ability to see the beauty in everything around us. Art is self-expression for us and our clients when we're working with them. Art allows us to tell stories that cannot be told with words. Um, that goes back to the body language stuff. So what is art? I believe the following, again, is true in regards to boudoir photography. It's an expression of one's world where anything can happen at their own wish. Isn't that a beautiful idea? Like, wow. Wow. That's just amazing. You can let go of all of the social kind of constraints, all of the all of the inner demons and constraint constraints, and it can just be anything that you wish it to be. Um, art is a visual storybook of emotions. So true when it comes to boudoir photography. Art allows you to see the world through your own imagination. 
or it's a way to express emotions and the innermost self to others and help our clients do that. Art can be the realization of self. This is powerful when we're talking about boudoir photography. Art provides a space to be expressive and secure in that experience. Again, huge when we're working with our clients. Um, how many of you have experienced some of the things that I'm talking about here? I'm curious in the comments if you could tell me that would be amazing. Okay, so art is generally understood as an activity or product done by people with a communicative pur purpose, something that expresses an idea and emotion. So for us, emotion being the very key component. Um, art in its broadest sense is a form of communication and it means whatever the artist intends it to mean. Um, and this meaning is actually shaped by the materials, techniques, and forms it makes use of, as well as the ideas and feelings it creates in its viewers. And art is an exact of, is an act of expressing feelings, thoughts, and observations. So one role of art is that art expresses the emotions and struggles of the society it exists within, within its time, and inspire society to cope and even overcome. Again, so incredibly relevant to us as boudoir photographers. I know some of you might be thinking like, why is Denise doing a coffee talk on art history? This is exactly why it's incredibly important, guys. Um, and just so that you know, this is like a little overview of a very in-depth lesson that I teach within Strip Down and we dive much deeper into it. Um, but I do take my students through all of this with a lot of homework and a lot of work that they do around it. But it's such an integral part of really stepping into your true authentic artistic self um, and working with precision and intention. And when you do that, the creativity is like pff, off the hook, right? And the things that you create are amazing. So again, the definition of art is really open. It's subjective. It's debatable. There's no agreement, uh, no agreement amongst art historians or artists, which is why we're left with so many definitions of art. And you can see that in the thread that I put up the other day about art. Like it was all over the place. Community came in and had a million things to say. We're kind of all have our own idea of it, but there are some basic tenets to it. So the concept itself has actually changed over centuries, but to bring it down to its most basic and simple terms to me, um, and I think it very much applies to our industry and our genre of art, um, it is the most basic and simple terms to me. It's a piece that evokes the beauty of the human condition and it evokes emotions in the subject that we're shooting and in the viewers of our work. And that's what we want. That's like what we're all striving to do, right? We all get into this for a reason. We don't come at, most of us don't come into boudoir photography just to like make the cash. Like that's nice. We want to be business owners who are successful and supporting ourselves with our art. But I think so many of us have a higher calling when we're doing this. And it's really important to honor that higher calling. And when you do honor that higher calling, your work grows immensely and you become far more successful, right? Um, but we can't just come at it from this direction. We have to put that component into place. So we all have the power to do this if we know how to do it. Um, I try and give you like free information in here and free education in here. All of the really good deep stuff is in the stripped down course. Um, but I want to share as much as I can with you guys within the community because I really want to elevate the industry. So the branches of art. So there are so many branches of art. It's ridiculous, right? There are so many. Um, 
So, but there are many branches of art that are beautiful and diverse, but for today, the ones we can draw the most knowledge and inspiration from are going to be painting, photography, and dance. So now it's time to jump in and explore what we can and create a solid foundation for our own work. Um, let's see, I just wanted to check the... Yep, so I've got Facebook users saying I prefer to look at something that makes me feel somewhere or another absolutely I absolutely love going to historical fine art pieces for inspiration in fact a big part of my road trips is to visit art museums and galleries abroad I love getting huge inf inf inspiration from it myself as well oh my god in Europe in New York when I hit a museum it's like pff, everybody get out of my way because I have got soaking up to do um, and inspiration to like be filling myself up with. So painting and photography. Painting and photography may seem to be of two different worlds, but they're actually, they actually intersect and they complement each other. So painters have used photographs to help them create their art. And many photographers study paintings to help improve their photography. So when photography was born more than a hundred years ago, it totally shook shit up in the art world, like big time, you guys. And there was this huge divide and a really big argument that was quite contentious, um, whether or not it was art and many people actually concluded that rather than being art, it was simply just like mechanical depiction, um, which unfortunately I believe that this is still a very strong argument for so much of our medium today. Um, think of all the like gearhead stuff where, you know, everything is about lighting and very stiff posing and, cropping and all of that kind of stuff. And we're not taking into account the humanity of our subjects and creating an emotive feel in our work. So nevertheless, paintings and photography eventually complemented and ended up really influencing each other in ways that were like no one expected. I mean, photography kind of came in and changed the art world. Um, and art really changed what photography is. Painting really changed what photography is. So the images taken by a photographer oftentimes have many similarities to what a painter creates. So we use different mediums, but we both consider light, color, composition, and my opinion, by far most importantly to the portrait genre, is body language in order to tell those beautiful, meaningful stories that, by the way, guys, have lasted hundreds of years, in some cases, thousands of years, in some cases. So both mediums are creative works that are visual. And if we're open to exploring the connections among art forms, and we should be, we should be open to all art forms, we can be incredibly inspired by art and create unique, beautiful works of art ourselves. So looking outside of our box, um, and certainly our industry, we can learn from the great masters that came before us, um, which is wonderful, right? So painters often emphasize the subject and pay close attention to composition, to light, to body language, because they have to tell a story without using words and create strong visual interest to engage their viewers. So a good example of this is the following painting by Shivago. Um, and the artist used invisible leading lines. And what I'm talking about there is this gaze. So we see like this line, this invisible leading line from his gaze down to the gaping wound on Jesus. And again, we see that invisible leading line. And again, we see that invisible leading line. This was not done by accident. This was done very intentionally, right? So he wanted to bring attention to that. He wanted to create that emotive feel. You see in the body language of Jesus, oh my God, it's like so beautiful. You see fear in, in all of these. Like it makes you feel. This is not a good situation and you are feeling it. And those leading lines totally bring you into 
what this story is telling. So we can learn from this how to use leading lines or even invisible lines to bring attention to the parts of a story that we want to bring attention to and emphasize an image that we can get, we create. So, you know, like using, you know, putting up a window blind and having like harsh light coming through it, we can create like leading lines with that. There's just so many different ways that we can do that. Invisible leading lines by looking down the body at a body part. Um, there's so many ways that we can play with leading lines that are going to help express our story even better and convey the body language um, in a very elevated type of way. So I want you guys to take note of that one. Okay. So we all understand the importance of and use of light and contrast in photography. That's mm -hmm. like, you know, 101. We know that. And if you look at several famous paintings, not just this one, but many of them, you'll find that contrast is really an integral part of telling story in paintings and same in photography. So oftentimes painters use a contrast of light and dark to make a subject stand out. So they'll position a dark subject against a light background or vice versa. Um, a good example of that emphasis um, is this aspect in it's the reconciliation of David and Absalom by Rembrandt. Um, and in this painting, Rembrandt's background has a lot of really dark, rich tones and his subject at the center of the image is covered in a much brighter, like ethereal kind of tones and colors. And as such, the subject appears much stronger than the background and using this technique in his painting also adds a dramatic flair to the scene something that we can again translate into our own work so if we look we've got all of this dark background around us and then we've got in the middle right here our subject who is like bathed in all of this beautiful light and color and so the first place we look is here and then the first thing we see is this beautiful body language that's depicting a story of sorrow or or loss or or, or longing and fear, um, you can interpret it how you want, but by creating that darker background and really pushing our subject forward and then using body language in an intentional way with precision, we're clear about this story and it's beautiful. We want to be able to translate this into our own work. So as photographers, we can use this technique to make our subject stand out and to add a creative, more dramatic touch to our photographs. So highlighting the subject also allows us to really showcase body language and tell more detailed stories. I'm wondering if any of you have any questions at this point. I'm, I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys might have. Um, so someone said that, not going to lie, painting, like actually painting has also helped my makeup skills as well as my understanding of light and vice versa. Yeah, spot on for sure. Okay, so we're going to move on. If you have questions, let me know. Lighting is an essential technique, technical component of our work as photographers. Even if it's just natural light, we know and understand how to use it and it's emotive effects on our work. And in the painting above that we're looking at, um, lighting is also really important. Its intensity, the direction, and the focus are essential in helping create a painting that actually tells a story. And Rembrandt was incredibly famous for this, right? So his portraits were really dramatic due to his use of shadow and light which is something that we see is very much trending in our industry right now. And we can see an example of this in his very famous self-portrait. Um, and Rembrandt lighting, it's it's like really, like it's the studio photographer's like go-to in so many cases. Um, it's often used by classical studio photographers who want to create drama by controlling light. And hence the famous Rembrandt lighting technique that so many of us have, have been taught and that so many of us actually use. And right there is an example of how we are 
so inspired by, even if we don't know it, how we are inspired by the great masters who came before us. So why not dive a little bit deeper? Why not, right? Okay, so here's another painter, and this is Jan Vermeer. And Vermeer chose to focus on natural lighting. And I'm just going to, let's see if I can go back. We can. So if we look at all of this and we look at the shadow following on his face and how deep and moody it is, we see and understand Rembrandt lighting, right? And then we look at this and it legitimately looks like we're in our studio using a window, right? Like the light is soft. It is ethereal. It is just, oh my God, it's beautiful. Can you tell I like natural lighting? It just bathes our subject in this like serene beauty. There's, to me, there's like this quality of the natural light that just is unmatched. It's incredible. So Vermeer is one of my favorites. I saw someone say Rembrandt being their favorite and Rembrandt was an incredible, incredible artist. Vermeer, um, in terms of lighting, one of my favorites because I just think it's so beautiful. So Vermeer used softer contrast and more natural lighting um, in his technique. Thus, the subjects come out more subtle. They come out softer. Um, we see this way of using light oftentimes in photographers who are using natural, natural light, window light, and who also work outdoors. Um, so we'll see this a lot in like wedding photography um, and boudoir photography where people like to use natural light. Um, and I just think, I think both are really gorgeous. And I don't think either is right or wrong. It's just kind of what you're drawn to. And even more exciting is that you can do both. Like you don't have to be confined to one or the other. You can experiment and play and be inspired people. Totally be inspired. Okay, so we're going to go through a brief history of painting through history. Um, you might, if you have pen and paper and you can, you might want to take notes on this in case you want to go, you know, check it out later. But we have the early and high Renaissance, which was between 1400 and 1550. And this was in painting, this was a rebirth of classical culture. And then we have mannerism from 1527 to 1580. And that was art that was breaking the rules, the artifice over nature. And then we move into Baroque, mm -hmm, one of my favorites. Um, and this was splendor. It was a flourish for God and art as a weapon in religious wars. I'm not sure that I'm crazy about that part, but the work that came out of the Baroque period was just bananas. Um, we have neoclassical. This is from 1750 to 1850. And this is art that captures more of a Greco-Roman grace. Um, romanticism, um, another one of my favorites, uh, from 1780 to 1850. And this was the triumph over imagination and individuality. That's kind of like the hallmark of that movement. And then realism, and this was from 1848 and 1900. And this was one of the first times that we saw this within art history. And it was celebrating working class and peasants, which isn't something that was normally done in art. It was like more reserved for nobility, royalty, people with the money to commission the paintings. Um, so I think realism was an important movement. And I want to be clear, there are a lot more movements than this, um, but I kind of plucked out the ones that were kind of important that I think you can learn the most from. And then we have Impressionism. And that was 1865 to 1885. And it captured fleeting effects of natural light. You guys, this was a groundbreaking movement and really, really important important in the direction that modern art was going to go. Then we have post-impressionism from 1885 to 1910, and it was a bit of a soft revolt against impressionism, but still maintained a lot of the impressionistic qualities. Um, we have Fauvism and expressionism from 1900 to 1935. Um, this was really, this movement was really, it still had the impression at the loose brush strokes and all of that stuff that went along with impressionism, but we started seeing the bold colors centered on, on emotive feelings. So we started using, in this period, we started using color to evoke 
emotion, which it does. Um, and you'll see it. Uh, and then we have cubism and futurism. And this was 1905 and 1920. Um, and experimental ways to express modern life and emotions. Many say cubism is probably the single most advanced um, in modern art and really paved the way for all that's come since. And then surrealism and Dada, which happens to be way up there on my list, um, from 1917 to 1950, and surreal art was depicting dreams and exploring the unconscious. No wonder it's one of my favorites, right? Okay, so let's talk about Renaissance really quick. So Renaissance art period was between the 14th and 16th centuries in Europe, and it was under the combined influence of an increased awareness of nature and a revival of classical learning. And there was a rising interest in perspective and in space that gave the art even more realism. So artists such as Michelangelo, Vermeer, Da Vinci, Rembrandt, Raphael, they all flourished during this period. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard those, those names. Um, and during the Renaissance, there was a revolution in philosophy and in science and mathematics that dramatically, dramatically changed arts and culture. So characteristics of Renaissance art include perspective and depth, linear perspective, foreshortening, which is compression as we know it. And in the next slide, I want you to watch for these characteristics. So Renaissance is actually a French word meaning rebirth, and it was the beginning of art as most of us define it and are familiar with it. So I'm seeing a question. So uh, to clarify, I mean, in the lighting style, Vermeer is actually my favorite old world painter. Yeah, I, I I feel you on that. The lighting in his work was just, the way he painted with light was incredible. So, okay, let's take a look at Renaissance. So let's just go back really quick. So I want you to watch for linear perspective, foreshortening, compression. Um, I want you to look for um, the rebirth um, of art being more moved by what was going on at the time, right? So there was this revolution in philosophy and science and mathematics, and it really, really did change art and culture. So let's take a look. Ah, oh, right, guys, such beautiful work. And we've got incredible, beautiful body language here. Um, again, very beautiful body language, beautiful light, depth, colors, gorgeous body language again. Uh, maybe some controversial subjects, heads on plates. I don't know, a little controversial, um, but nonetheless, really beautiful. And there's not a thing missing in any of them. If you look at the hands, the hands are just like on point. They're spot on. The facial expressions, all of it, it's incredibly beautiful. There's a lot more realism in it, um, and it is quite beautiful. Okay, so next we're going to move on to Baroque. So in its most typical manifestations, Baroque art is characterized by great drama. Mm -hmm, very great drama, rich, deep color, and intense light and dark shadows. So some of the qualities most frequently associated with the Broke era are grandeur, sensuous richness, drama, movement, tension, and emotional exuberance, and a tendency to blur distinctions between the various arts. So in the Baroque period, they were doing a lot of like um, it wasn't just Baroque, wasn't just a painting movie. It, it was throughout all of the artistic mediums. So the Baroque period was a reflection of the profound political and cultural changes then emerging across Europe. It was thought that these two elements <clears throat> that Baroque painters were sought to evoke emotional states in the viewer by appealing to the senses, often in dramatic ways. So Let's take note of that in looking at these images. <sighs> They're 
just absolutely phenomenal, right? Like the use of the sensuous rich colors, the use of shadow and light, the use of like the emotional exuberance in the images. Um, this one in particular is one that I absolutely love and it's a little small and we can't see it very well. I might post it in the group later, but we've got <clears throat> this incredible leading line coming in this direction. We've got another leading line with this hand, another leading line with this hand. When we can see it bigger, we can see part of his face being like, oh no, really like trouble. And then we see everyone, our, you know, our group of people here is pointing to, it was him. I don't know what he did, but he's in trouble. Uh, and we can feel it by the use of like the shadow, the sensuousness, the richness, the deepness, and his body language. Look at that, like slumped over, like, oh no, what have I done? You know, kind of feeling. Um, and this is just a beautiful example of what was done in the Baroque period. Um, something I think everybody should, you know, go out and research. Okay, so let's move on to Romanticism. So Romanticism emphasized emotion. And this was an artistic, literary, musical, and intellectual movement. I wish I would have been there. Um, romantic art focused on emotions feelings and moods of all kinds and the subject matter it really varied wildly um it included landscapes religion revolution and peaceful beauty the brushwork for romantic art started to become looser and less precise as time went on this is important to notice um, romantics believed in the natural goodness of humans. They believed that the savage is noble, that childhood is beautiful and good, and the emotions inspired by both beliefs caused the heart to soar. No wonder they were called romantics, right? So romantics believe that knowledge is gained through intuition rather than deduction. Um, I don't know if I wholly agree with that, but I think there's there's something to that. Oh, yep. One of my favorite periods. It's just absolutely beautiful. I'm curious what you guys think of this particular period. I'm really, really drawn to it. I want to hear what you guys have to say. And I'm going to wait until you guys start saying something. And I'm waiting. Uh, you can even tell me which of your favorite, like, which is your favorite painting? Yeah, okay. You guys don't want to engage with me this morning. You just want me to talk at you. <laughs> well, for me, it is really full of emotion. Um, I love the darkness, but it's got this romantic yet fear to it. Yeah, so we see, like, if we go back here really quick um, and we talk about the subject matter, um, let's see, uh, romantic art focused on emotions, feelings, and moods of all kinds. So they were trying to create an emotional feel in their work and, um, I'm going to say they did it beautifully. Like this is definitely, it might not be something that we want to capture, but this is strong and emotive. Um, this is also beautifully sublime and very emotive. Again, incredibly sublime and emotive, but it looks like we also have like a little goblin or demon or something sitting back here. So there's a little bit of tension in that. And then this painting with all of the wildness going on, there's all kinds of emotion in that. And then there's also a, an incredibly sublime and beautiful feeling in this one as well. So they really push towards creating emotive states that we're going to pull the viewers in, whether it be something that's like really strong and like, <gasps> right? Or whether it's just like, oh, 
languid or two lovers running off together into the forest um, or a woman laid across her bed languidly um, and or what looks like to me a sex party with all kinds of different emotion going on within it. Um, and yeah, Amber, I, I agree. Fear isn't always scary. It's sometimes beautiful. Lions are fearful, but they're beautiful. Um, I do love romanticism. I think Baroque and Renaissance are my favorites, though, along with Impressionists. Ooh, can't wait to get the imp to get to the Impressionists out. That's really good. Um, but I think the Romantics did a beautiful job at really like working on the emotive states of their subjects, not just with light, but with body language, facial expressions, um, and all of those things. Okay, so Impressionism, here we go. Uh, for whoever said they really love Impressionism, here we go. So Impressionism was a radical art movement that began in the late 1800s, and it was centered primarily around Parisian painters. Impressionists rebelled against classical subject matter and embraced creating works that reflected the feeling of the world that they lived in. So not necessarily like an actual depiction, but the feeling feeling that things impressed upon them. So they rejected the very rigid rules of the fine arts and showcased a new way to depict the world. So foregoing realistic portrayals for fleeting impressions of their surroundings were actually the hallmark of this movement. And they weren't trying to paint realistic pictures, but moreover, an impression of what the person, object, or landscape looked, and more importantly, felt like to them. So Impressionist artists, they really relaxed the boundary between subject and background so that the effect of an Impressionist painting often resembles somewhat of a snapshot, like a moment in time. We're almost in that moment with them. And a part of a larger reality captured almost as if by chance, but make no mistake, there was no chance in this. So the development of Impressionism can be considered a partial reaction by artists to the challenge presented by photography, which I think is amazing, right? So photography seemed to devalue the artist's skill at the time in reproduction in the reproducing reality and in spite of this photography actually inspired artists to pursue other means of artistic impression expression so rather than compete with photography to emulate reality impressionists sought to express their perceptions and their feelings and their emotions of the world around them which I think is absolutely beautiful. I think it's wonderful that photography had a role in moving art forward in that way. So here we can see some beautiful Impressionism. Um, it's, oh God, yeah, I love it. You know, I don't know if there's a movement that I don't like, to be perfectly honest with you. As we go through these every time, I'm just like, oh, love. Um, the image to the bottom right this is just like so vulnerable and so feminine and so beautiful that I can't be, I can't, I can't even help it. I'm just like sucked into this image. I can sit with this image for a really long time and just feel it's just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, top left, same thing. Beautiful. Um, obviously, Degas' um, series of dancers were incredible and gave us that movement. And those loose brush strokes created really like that capturing of a moment that was just fucking spectacular. Um, there's so much vulnerability and beauty and impressionism. Um, I think we because we were relying so heavily on the feels um, and capturing those moments that felt like we were actually there experiencing it with them. And they're quite, quite beautiful. Um, whoever said they loved the portrait of the man on the last page and they were going to try and recreate it, you're going to have to at me in that because I'm really excited to see what you do. That's going to be amazing. 
Okay, so we're going to move on to cubism. So cubism was created by our wonderful Mr. Picasso and Georges Baroque. Um, and they employed geometric shapes in depictions of human and other forms. And over time, the geometric touches grew so intense that they sometimes overtook the representation of the forms, creating like a more pure level of visual abstraction. So cubism absolutely revolutionized European painting and sculpture. Um, you can see the progression, but when we get to cubism, there's this like uh, hard turn, right? Where everything just like, put, they're like, fuck the rules. We're going in and doing what we want to do. I don't know if you guys know this, but Picasso refused to be commissioned. I think there was only one time publicly that I'm aware of that he was actually commissioned to paint something. Um, he refused to do anything that was not of himself. So cubism has been considered the most influential art movement of the 20th century. So cubism was an attempt by artists to revitalize what they felt was like the really tired traditions of Western art. They were being punk rock, right? Um, which they believed had run its course. So the cubist challenged conventional forms of representation, such as perspective, which had been the rule since the Italian Renaissance. So they really diverged and they struggled for a lot of years before it was accepted, but boy, was it accepted. So here we can see some beautiful examples of cubism and, and you can see how everything changed. But the thing I want to point out to you is somehow even in this, the body language of these geometric shapes are still telling the stories. Like, you guys, this is how important body language is. We've got geometric shapes that are creating our subjects, but the body language of these geometric shapes are still conveying what the story is. And it's beautiful. Um, it's amazing how our brains work. It, it really, truly is. It's phenomenal. Okay. So let me see. Just comment. So fun fact, I recently read an article that photography might have had a helping hand in some of those old Dutch painters like Vermeer too. They used early camera technology to capture and project the reflected scene down onto the canvas. Um, if I hadn't had the chance to look further into it, but I love finding out little uh, photography history tidbits like that. Me too, me too. I'm such an art nerd. It's not even funny. Art and science nerd. Um, okay, so moving on to surrealism. So surrealism is more than artistic style. It's actually an artistic movement. Um, unlike any other creative movements, which can be characterized by themes of imagery, color choices, or techniques, defining surrealist art is slightly harder to do. So the surrealists like Joan Monroe, Dali, Picasso, Cheval, among so many others, the list is huge, you guys. They seek to explore the unconscious mind as a way of creating art, resulting in dreamlike, sometimes really bizarre imagery across endless mediums. They, they went at all of it. Um, the core of surrealism is focused on illustrating the mind's deepest thoughts automatically when they surface. And that this thought process for creating art is known as uh, automatism. So the surrealist movement uh, initially surfaced in 1924 when the French poet André Breton published his manifesto of surrealism. And it was influenced by the theories and writings on the unconscious mind by psychologist Sigmund Freud and the groundbreaking studies of Carl Jung. We talked about him earlier and the early 20th century Dada movement as well. So while surrealism started as a literary movement um, in the prose and poetry of Breton and others, visual artists Dutch, such as Giorgio de Shiro, Pablo Picasso, Francis Picabia, 
um, Marcel Duchamp, they all embraced surrealism and were recognized in Breton's 1925 publication, La Révolution Surrealiste. So a movement which even now has its flames still burning. It ain't gone, it's still here. The likes of Dali, Duchamp, Breton, Man Ray, Marguerite, and Picasso, they all played really pivotal roles in its succession and it's in its legacy. However, within surrealist art genre, one medium really came to fruition as was, and was explored in ways that had never been before. And that was actually photography. And this is kind of when photography started moving more into the realm of art. So the surrealist channel, the subconscious in an unrestrained, provocative concentration on dream and subconscious. So surrealism is entirely its own as an art movement with photography playing a pivotal role in its success. So the surrealists were the pioneers of double exposure and so many other effects that create dreamlike states, as well as effects to reach into the subconscious. So when we play with like doohickeys or we put colored gels over things, or we create double exposures, or we use motion blur, or we use that lens baby that I'm about to get, um, or we put like little plastic baggies or tool or any of those kind of things that you can think of, that was all born of the surrealist and Dada movement, you guys. That's where it came from. It's good to know our past, right? So some beautiful work that came out of the surrealist movement. Um, and you can start to see things here that we start emulating in photography later on. Um, and a lot of these things with composites and stuff that we also emulate in photography. And you can also see a window into the subconscious of the, of the artists who were creating. So now let's talk about Dada. So Dada is a movement influenced by other avant-garde movements like Cubism, Futurism, Expressionism, and its output, again, widely diverse, ranging from performance art to poetry, photography, sculpture, painting, and collage. Um, it, it absolutely flouted conventional aesthetic and cultural values by producing works marked by nonsense, travesty, and incongruity. I'm here for it. <laughs> so next we're going to explore some of the photography that came from the Dada movement. There's a lot of brilliant art. There's a lot of brilliant pose. There's a lot of brilliant poetry. There's amazing paintings. There's wonderful sculptures, collage, like all this stuff. But we're going to focus on photography. Um, so commercial photography and fine art photography has been massively influenced by these groundbreaking artists and especially Man Ray, who was a leading artist in the Dada movement and became an influential fashion photographer and really did change the face of fashion photography, bringing art into what was previously just a depiction, right? So we went from creating pretty pictures, which is what so much of us do because we don't understand body language and how to coach and direct for it to really bringing beautiful emotive states into work, um, dreamlike things, and becoming incredibly creative. So we have some beautiful work in Dada. We can see collage work. Um, we can see just artistic work. We can see the use of prisms and exposures. Um, I mean, just all kinds of amazing things, right? And again, more haunting, haunting work that just really pulls you in. It's absolutely beautiful. So again, if you have a pen and a paper, I want you to do some exploring. If you're not familiar with the works of the following photographers, you're in for a treat. You might want to check out Jules Leon, Alexei Brodovich, Helmut Newton, Gordon Parks, Guy Bourdin, Tim Walker, Edward Steichen, Herb Ritz, uh, Mr. La Chapelle, Mizell, and I'm going to have to add to this list Lillian Bassman and Ellen von Unworth. 
So at this point in the presentation, I want to bring something up because I think this is really important. Diversity and representation um, is really lacking in art history. And I think it's important to note that in art history, there's been a historical lack of representation. So classical art is truly lacking in inclusivity. And with that being said, I actually found some great like documentaries as well as modern photographers and artists that we can explore and we can actually be part of the change. So if you're looking for more diversity and representation, because I can't change what happened in art history, but what I can bring you is information on what is happening now so that you can be inspired. Um, if you're looking for more diversity and representation, you can check out the following badass artists like Gordon Sadraj, Mackenzie James, Brianna Roy, Jordan Castile, and David Briscoll. Um, one of my favorite artists right now is Ja Gray, and he did a um, he did a project um, with another artist that was just beautiful. I'll find it and I'll link to it in the comments. Um, I think you guys should check it out. So. Um, Jaw says, vulnerability is the core of shame and fear, but it's also the birthplace of joy, creativity, belonging, and love. Of course, I'm going to love him, right? So my series is all, my series is about vulnerability. Vulnerability is something I struggle with every day. The struggle with allowing myself to be seen and the struggle with remembering to embrace my imperfections. This series is about me embracing my vulnerability, my realization that what makes me vulnerable makes me beautiful, my eagerness to let go of who I thought I should be in order for me to be my true self. Uncomfortable, but necessary. My self-portraits show my vulnerability. I wish I would have said this. <laughs> um, I mean, I say it in some ways, but this is so incredibly important for us as boudoir photographers. We have such a huge responsibility. We're not just taking wedding photos. We're not just taking high school senior portraits. We are working with the most delicate and sensitive aspects of the humans that we work with. And we have to embrace this type of mindset where we set ourselves free so that we can set them free, allow them to have the space to be free. Photographer, definitely worth looking into. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the art of movement and emotion. So um, this is Natalia Ospiova. She is the prima. She was the prima. I don't know if she still is at the Royal Opera in London. And she says, when I'm dancing with him, I convinced he's the man I love. Your every gesture should bring meaning. You must speak with your eyes, your hands, or the turn of your head. You tell the story by the way you move. The parallels in this to portrait photography and boudoir photography are phenomenal, right? They're there, absolutely. We can draw a tremendous amount of inspiration from dance as well. So dance is essentially emotion in motion. And that's what makes our movements so incredibly moving. In dance, our purpose is to actually express emotions, communicating physically, allowing those feelings to move through the body, out of the body, and in doing so to move to others. And dance has been present in human culture and history for centuries now. And in its origins, it was meant to be used as a way of communicating for ceremonial rites and celebrations, mostly. Um, and through dance, dancers can express feelings and emotions, conveying a message to the audience. So dance is indeed not confined to simply a component of the performing arts, even though that in and of itself is a method of communication. Significantly, dance plays a bigger role in communication. It is communication through physical movements. So... There's been a wide trend. There's been a widespread trend over the last several years within the portrait photography community to photograph dancers. We've all seen it. Head into any Facebook group that specializes in beauty portraits, and you're going to see dancers abounding. And we see a lot of like the top name uh, boudoir photographers and/or photographers really like 
photographing dancers or themselves dancing or or at least getting their clients into like dancing poses and even within the boudoir community there's been a movement to photograph dancers because they know how to move they know how to tell a story and they know how to do our job for us and that's great Bring in a dancer, take beautiful pictures. They're going to be great. Your clients are going to see them on your Instagram. Your clients are going to see them on your website. And then you're going to have a client who doesn't dance come in. And you're going to be like, uh, not sure what to do. Learning this emotion in motion, learning body language is incredibly important if this is something that you want to do. So I do not believe it's necessarily a conscious effort on the part of all who photograph dancers to take the work out of our craft. But I do believe by understanding body language, by studying dancers, models, painters, and learning the art of emotion, we can learn ourselves and then we can guide and coach our clients into their very own beautiful innermost stories, collaborating and creating beautiful works of art with them and for them. Pieces that we're proud of, things that are going to make us stand out, that are going to give us the foundation we need to have incredibly thriving and successful businesses and feel good about what it is we're doing. So we're going to move into hands really quickly because this is a big point of contention for me. The hands are actually the most intricate visible structure of the human body. So they're not just marvels of design able to perform complex mechanical actions. They also have the ability to express the characteristics and emotional states of their processors, of their possessors, excuse me. And that's why it's essential for portrait painters, photographers, and dancers to get them right. You guys, hands are important. So, so many of us struggle with hands and now, you know, you're actually in good company. It's a universal struggle, not just in photography and painting and dancing and sculpture and all of it. Um, it's just a struggle for the artists, but we all have to master how to tell beautiful stories and hands are definitely a part of it. So hands are incredibly important part of the body are an important part of body language. We use our hands every day to gesticulate and embellish our thoughts, even simple gestures such as standing with our hands behind our backs or the softness of our touch are clues. So despite the, you know, despite the acquisition of verbal language that we've acquired over time, um, over millions of years of human evolution, our brains are actually still hardwired, scientific, scientifically proven. Our brains are still hand-wired to engage our hands um, in actually communicating our emotions, our thoughts, and our sentiments. Therefore, when people are speaking or not, hand gestures merit our intention as rich sources of nonverbal behavior to help us understand the thoughts and feelings of others. And that's exactly why bad hands in a photo can absolutely be the kiss of death. So I think later on, I'm probably going to do something on hands because I think it's so important and it's not something that we're taught as photographers. And I really do think it's something that we need to learn as an industry. We need to learn how to use hands. Very passionate about this, having been a dancer as well as a model um, and also a lover of art. So it's something to start thinking about, start paying attention to hands. Um, symmetrical hands. This like, this is just not naturally occurring in nature. Nobody like does this when they're feeling something or this when they're feeling something. Hands are generally a little bit more sy symmetrical. They're a little bit more fluid. They're a little bit more engaged. They actually rub. They don't lay flat across the body when you're rubbing. They rub the body, the fingertips engage. They come in with the hair. They don't, they're not always symmetrical. They generally don't do this. Like Every photo I see like this, I'm like, why is the hand like that? So, and I'm guilty. I have some of those too, I'm not going to lie. Um, but really being aware of the hands and the story they're telling. And hands can hold a lot of tension. So keeping those hands free and moving, it's important in our images. It's going to make a big difference. Okay. There are entire courses 
like dedicated to the study of hands, you guys, it's one of the first things that when you're being tra classically trained uh, in sketching and or painting, you have to learn how to work with hands. It's really important. Okay, so if we choose to expand our horizons and draw influence and information from the other branches of art, we can only become better. We really, we can only become better. So I believe that having a knowledge and understanding of the classical arts is one of the reasons that I personally coach and direct the way that I do. Um, it's so incredibly ingrained in me to feel and emote. And I really want to share that with you. So we have work to do. I hope today was helpful for you. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have before I sign off. Um, let me take a look really quick. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Someone wants to, the... okay. So yeah, maybe I will do something on the lens, baby. We'll see, Sergio. Um, thank you for this amazing information. You are welcome. Um, Yeah, someone said they don't think that they ever really thought about how much their history in ballet has helped their posing, especially my acute attention to pointed toes. Mm -hmm. It totally does. It totally does. Okay, so I hope today's presentation and copy talk was informative for you. Um, I always strive to bring you as much value as I possibly can and to elevate the industry as best as I can. Um, I'd love to see here, see you here back next Tuesday for our coffee talk. Um, I want to let you guys know teaser. We're going to start talking about the next launch of strip down. It's going to be coming soon. If you haven't taken the course and you want to get your work to a level that is just phenomenal, like Kaylee's, um, or so many other of my alumni, I would love to have you in class. Um, so keep an eye on this space. We're going to talk, start talking about it soon. If you're in here and you're catching this on a replay, let me know you're catching it on a replay. Um, if you have any questions for me or you just want to engage with me, I'm just a DM away. I'm happy to talk with you guys. My, I have this heart to serve that's insane. Like I just want to bring as much value and as much love and as much knowledge and information as I can to this industry, because I truly believe that our clients deserve it. And I truly believe that you deserve to feel confident in your work, that you're not going through posing guide after posing guide, trying to figure out what to do and missing the piece that truly brings it all together. Um, so I hope to see you in the next strip down. And I hope to see you at the next coffee talk. Um, everybody have a beautiful day. Um, go watch hands today. Do that. Just watch hands. Um, and then maybe look up some of your favorite artists or maybe some of your favorite like periods. And I will see you guys soon. Mwah. Thank you for being with me. I really appreciate it. Have a beautiful day. Go make beautiful things in the world. Bye, guys.